Today's video is sponsored by Ground News. They gather related news articles from around the world in one place, so you have the full context on any story. I found myself using their app and their website quite a lot lately. Check them out at ground.news slash company man. Barnes & Noble is a national chain of bookstores that, despite selling over 190 million physical books each year, I think most would agree is not nearly as strong as they used to be. It can be debated as to when they were at their peak because it depends on what measure you value the most. You can make an argument for the period around 2011 or 2012, given that those are their highest selling years, the only time that they ever exceeded $7 billion in revenue. Their longtime rival, Borders, had just filed for bankruptcy, so a lot of their former customers were taking their business over to Barnes & Noble, given that they were the only remaining national bookstore chain. However, that would be a very surface level assessment, because looking just a little bit deeper, we can see that despite high sales, Barnes & Noble was already losing a lot of money in those years and it started closing locations. Simply put, online retailers, mainly Amazon, were disrupting the industry. They were a big reason behind the failure of Borders, and Barnes & Noble was also struggling to keep up with them. I will talk about it in more detail, but these are problems that had been brewing since the 1990s, and this right here is when they were finally starting to have a major impact. I would argue that the true peak of Barnes & Noble was somewhere in the mid-2000s. As you saw in the graph, those were their most profitable years, but also it's when their stock price was hitting all-time highs, and it's when they were still opening new stores, peaking at 726 of them in 2008. However you want to look at it, it is clear that Barnes & Noble has since declined significantly, to a point where in 2018, things were looking really bad for them. In February of that year, they announced that they were laying off 1,800 employees because they needed to save money. In July, they fired their CEO, initially without giving much reason, but later stating that it was because of sexual harassment allegations. By the end of that year, publishers were getting nervous that the company might go out of business, and reports were circulating that they were looking for someone to buy it, which did end up happening the following year, and the new owners made some changes that have seemingly helped improve their situation, potentially leading to a bit of a comeback. Okay, I need to slow down here because there has been so much happening. First, I want to talk about how Barnes & Noble grew so large in the first place. And the way I see it, it happened in three distinct eras. Starting with the Barnes and or Noble era, in 1917, William Barnes and Gilbert Clifford Noble teamed up to operate a New York City bookstore that mainly sold textbooks to nearby universities. In the the following years, it grew into a wholesale business that the public came to know for its large flagship store on Fifth Avenue. That store stood out from the others, partially because of the efficient system used by the employees to gather and sell the books to the customers, partially for being among the first stores to play instrumental music over the speakers, but probably mostly because of its size. It was expanded in the 1940s and later recognized as the world's largest bookstore. The second era, for lack of a better name, I'm going to call it their expansion era that was almost entirely fueled by a man named Leonard Riggio. In the early 1960s, he was a student at NYU, attending engineering classes at night and working at the school's bookstore during the day to help pay for those classes. By 1965, he had saved up $5,000 and used it to open his own college bookstore that was just around the corner from the one that he had just left. It did really well. He reinvested the profits to open four more of them, and in 1971, he was able to secure a $1.2 million dollar bank loan to buy Barnes & Noble. See, Noble had left the company many years earlier, before that flagship store even opened, so the Barnes family was in charge until John Barnes, the founder's grandson, had died in the 1960s. The company was sold shortly after to these new owners that weren't doing very well with it. It was declining, so they were willing to sell it to Leonard Reggio at a reasonable price. Oddly enough, Leonard Reggio was far more responsible for the success of this company than the people that it was named after. As as soon as he took over, he converted his existing bookstores into Barnes & Noble. He expanded their customer base beyond students by offering other non-fiction works that weren't necessarily textbooks. He opened a giant complex nearby that would sell discounted books, opened more Barnes & Noble locations initially in bordering states, and in 1974 started airing some of the first commercials within their industry, promoting their new tagline, of course, of course. Which, I don't know, seemed like it was a little bit forced. Barnes & Noble, of course. Of course. 
By the 1980s, the strategy was to expand the company by acquiring various mall-based bookstores. Most notably, they acquired B. Dalton for around $300 million. You may not recognize that name today because they have been gone for well over a decade, but back then, they were a huge chain of bookstores, much bigger than Barnes & Noble, as a matter of fact. It was the third largest bookstore buying the second largest. B. Dalton had twice the sales and 20 times the locations, though they were considerably smaller locations. The third era of Barnes & Noble is the one that we are still in today, the Superstore era. It was a popular trend in retail to open these giant stores that used economies of scale to offer low prices and incredible selections. By the 1990s, this was their new strategy, not only to offer thousands of titles, but to provide a relaxing atmosphere for customers to hang out and explore those titles. They added all of these comfy chairs, expanded their hours, made a deal with Starbucks to serve their coffee at cafes inside the stores. In 1993, they raised money through an initial public stock offering that was used to open hundreds of new stores under this concept while slowly closing the outdated B. Dalton locations. And by the way, Borders was doing something very similar in the way that they were embracing the new concept while transitioning away from the Walden bookstores that were under their ownership. Seriously, in the 1990s, these were the two taking over the industry. It was a controversial issue because they were putting a lot of independent bookstores out of business. If you have seen the movie You've Got Mail from 1998, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And that same year, they were even on the defending end of an antitrust lawsuit. Can you believe that the big concern back then was that Borders and Barnes & Noble were taking over book sales, which I think really shows how much times have changed. I think it's interesting how You've Got Mail is also a great representation of how technology and the internet was starting to creep into people's lives. Obviously, online shopping and e-commerce became a huge part of retail. We've seen it on this channel many times, where if you didn't embrace it, you got left behind. But I don't necessarily want to criticize Barnes & Noble too much here, because in my opinion, they didn't do all that bad with it. They did way better than Borders, at least, but it turns out that Amazon and Apple are pretty tough to compete with. Consider that Amazon has now become a threat to almost any retailer anywhere, right? Well, they started by selling books in 1995, meaning Barnes & Noble was among the first major companies that was threatened by them. Barnes & Noble started their website about two years later, and there was quickly a feud between them. Barnes & Noble sued Amazon for false advertising when they claimed to be the world's largest bookstore, and then Amazon sued Barnes & Noble for copying their one-click checkout system, both of which were settled out of court. By the end of the 1990s, Amazon was responsible for 75% of all online book sales, while Barnes & Noble was responsible for only 15%. Their online operations weren't profitable, far more books were being sold in person at the time, and their success had been mostly based on the environment within the stores. So even though the internet was considered to be the future, you can see why they would continue to focus on the physical stores, and not panic about being the, well, second largest online book retailer. Then, about a decade later, the new concern was e-readers. I remember hearing about these things all the time. Amazon came out with the Kindle in 2007, Barnes & Noble responded with their version called the Nook in 2009, Apple announced the iPad just a few months later, and then Borders released the Kobo the following summer. And by most accounts, the Nook was a decent product, because the company did invest a lot of money into it, probably too much. Some of the shareholders were even getting upset and saying that the money should be put toward the stores instead. I mean, it was on the front of their annual report, and they even got a new CEO named William Lynch because he had a background in e-commerce and technology. You can theorize that Barnes & Noble had trouble attracting people to it that weren't already customers at their stores. You could say that they didn't have as many attractive apps as the others, but in the end, I think it mostly goes back to competition. This right here was a bookstore competing against Amazon and Apple in the realm of technology. Overall, the Nook never sold very well and was mostly just money wasted. In 2012, Microsoft invested $300 million into the Nook division. They were going to work together on this new partnership that would hopefully make the Nook more relevant, but that ended up falling apart, so even Microsoft has lost money on this. It was looking like the Nook was going to be spun off into its own company along with their education business, but they ended up holding on to the Nook and just spinning off the other parts. Despite some respectable efforts, the Nook has not been good for Barnes & Noble. You might disagree with this, but when it comes to digital and e-commerce, I would say that Barnes & Noble has done as good as you would reasonably expect, but it's been tough, and Amazon has just done better. I want to bring attention to a bookstore in Britain called 
called Waterstones. It's the biggest chain in the area. Back in 2011, they were having troubles as well when a man named James Daunt was put in charge to try to turn things around for them. He had experience in the industry, having started his own small chain of stores around London, and was successful in reviving Waterstones. In 2018, Waterstones was bought by Elliott Management. In the following year, Elliott Management bought Barnes & Noble and placed James Daunt in charge of the company as the new CEO. He then proceeded to make a lot of changes at Barnes & Noble, many of which had already been proven to be successful over at Waterstones. He cut out the sale of a lot of items that weren't books themselves. He stopped taking money from publishers to place certain books in the front of the store and in the windows in favor of displaying books they feel customers are more likely to buy. And maybe most importantly, he started giving the store managers more authority when it comes to choosing which books to sell. The reasoning there being that they should have a better feeling as to what the customers want rather than a central office located in a different part of the country. Also, during the pandemic, when the stores were closed temporarily, they used that as an opportunity to update the appearance and alter the layouts. It is now a private company that doesn't report their figures, but they have revealed that their sales have been rising and expressed plans to start opening new stores again. I can't imagine that they're quite on the same level that they used to be, but it does look like they have been reversing the trend. It's unclear if it'll continue or what it'll lead to, but it does seem to be a good sign for the future of Barnes & Noble. Let me know in the comments, what do you think of Barnes & Noble? Have you been there before? Do you think it's a fun place to explore new books, or do you prefer one of the others? Maybe you thought Borders was better, or do you prefer to support the smaller or independent chains, or do you get your books from Amazon? I kind of prefer the audiobooks myself, so there are a lot of options out there. What do you think Barnes & Noble should have done differently, and do you see potential for a comeback? This is a wide topic, one of the biggest stories in retail, so any thoughts you have about Barnes & Noble, leave them in the comments. I'd like to hear what you have to say. You know, on Ground News, today's sponsor, I've been reading all about how a federal appeals court ruled that Texas book bans are unconstitutional, which is one of those controversial subjects that makes you question the accuracy and the bias from the source reporting on it, right? That is where Ground News comes in handy, applicable today because even booksellers have been seeing the effects of political debates. On this story alone, they have gathered more than 30 articles with coverage mainly from the left and center sources. You can scroll through the title of each headline and look at the tag showing if they lean a certain way politically, how factual their reporting is, and even who funds it. Looking closer at the coverage, I noticed that this media-owned left-leaning headline was the only source to highlight the positives, claiming readers rejoice at the ruling. You can see that it is a great way to evaluate news and think about stories more objectively. I encourage you to check them out at ground.news slash company man. They are independently owned and subscriber supported with plans starting at less than $1 a month. But if you use my link, you'll get 30% off unlimited access. The link is in the description. Thank you for watching.